Sustainable Development Forum from a uh, speech from organizers of this forum. Uh, we are held in this forum in Yakutsk, uh, Republic of Sakha Yakutia. It's far from Moscow, but in Russia. We have a huge country, you know, and uh, now um, we have minus 40 degrees by Celsius. It's very cold time, but um, it's a very pl it's a pleasure to have a lot of people coming uh, and interested in, in the Northern Sustainable Development Forum, uh, which is from 28 uh, to uh, 1st December held in Yakutsk. And thank you very much uh, for your interest uh, here in this platform, in this uh, session, uh, round table, round table about Russia and uh, Asian actors in the Arctic and in their opportunities of cooperation uh, between Russia and Asian uh, actors. Uh, and uh, I see um, my colleagues from uh, China, from India, um, hello <laughs> to you. Thank you very much um, from Russia, of course. And uh, I know that it's very important now for all of us to know what we can do with uh, the um, Arctic uh, cooperation. Because uh, uh, before we... Uh, had always uh, thinking that the Arctic is the uh, place of the peaceful cooperation. But now we don't know how we can uh, continue our cooperation with the other Arctic countries in this uh, global situation, geopolitics. So, um, yes, of course, it's very interesting for uh, Russia uh, to... Uh, have uh, a chance to have uh, this uh, um, uh, round table to uh, listen what do you think about the Arctic and Russia about the uh, uh, Asian Russian cooperation in the Arctic and thank you very much that you can uh, be with us this day and thank you very much to the Russian um, international uh affairs council uh for your uh organizing this uh, platform thank you very much thank you very much Diana. it's always a pleasure to work with north western federal university and uh it is indeed a pity that we are not all in yakutsk now but uh Hopefully, we will deliver the warmth to Moscow, where it is far warmer these days than in Yakutsk uh, to you. Uh, and now I'm uh, really delighted uh, to give the floor to Nikolai Korchinov, Chair of the Senior Arctic Officials and Ambassador at Large of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Russian Federation. Nikolai Viktorovich, thank you very much for finding the time and opportunity to be with us today. Uh, and please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, best wishes from uh, Moscow. We have we have uh, minus uh, four, not forty. Uh, dear distinguished guests, Arctic colleagues, uh, dear Yulia, it's my pleasure to participate today in this uh, round table and share a few words on the present and uh, future of the Arctic cooperation. As you know, Russia chairs uh, the Arctic Council in 21-23 in, in this work. Our country, among other things, uh, pays great attention to the issues of sustainable development of the Arctic region. The approach is based on ensuring the balance uh, between the economic growth of the countries and the prevention of negative environmental impacts. Our focus is uh, primarily on the development of advanced ecologically and uh, resource-friendly technologies for use in uh, transport uh, sector, industry, construction, energy, including the expansion of the use of renewable energy sources in the interest of improving the standard of living of the Arctic population, including indigenous peoples, and uh, mitigate the climate change. Uh, Russian Arctic, as you know, produced more than 11% uh, of the national GDP and over 20% of exports. Russia stands for more than 70% of all economic 
activities in the entire Arctic region. So we are committed to keeping it as an area of uh, peace and uh, constructive cooperation. The issues of a balanced, in, <clears throat> inclusive, sustainable development, the implementation of large-scale scientific and business projects are our priority. That is why the Arctic, uh, for us, uh, as a theater of war, is a, a not is not an an option. Regardless uh, complicated uh, international uh, situation, uh, the Russian Federation, as the largest Arctic state, is uh, continuing working to ensure the sustainable development of the Arctic for the benefits of the people people living in the region, including indigenous peoples. We perceive this concern, the attempts to pull... Recording in progress. ...to pull extra regional issues. So issues are not linked to the Arctic region into the agenda of the Arctic Council, which, we, which since its creation, more than a quarter of a century ago, includes only issues of sustainable development and uh, soft security in the region. There are many questions about the future of the council itself during the next presidency. That's uh, the, all this leads to increase of the risk of uh, uncertainty. And also we see how the collective approach are eroding to provide responsible management of very important Arctic issues. Uh, we proceed from the assumption that the future effective work of the Council will depend on whether we will be able to continue the mutually beneficial cooperation in the region in the interest of its entire population, including indigenous peoples, the preservation of the Arctic as a territory of peace, stability, and constructive interaction as it was reflected in the adopted in May 21 ministerial declaration and the strategic plan of the Arctic Council for the period up to 2030. So far, fortunately, we are uh, witnessing the degradation and fragmentation of uh, multilateral cooperation in the Hainos. And uh, that is why in the current situation, we uh, welcome cooperation with uh, all states and uh, uh, organizations that uh, adhere to a constructive approach to uh, cooperation, to, uh, to the development, uh, sustainable development of the region and to um, constructively uh, engaged in uh, the program of scientific cooperation on people-to-people uh, -people cooperation and, uh, and uh, business projects. In many uh, Asian countries, we especially welcome constructive and responsible approach of, uh, of those countries uh, which are uh, represented at this round table, namely China and uh, India. Uh, for my part, I would like to emphasize that the High North represents a huge potential for international cooperation, both in light of new challenges and threats and uh, emerging opportunities for the tourism infrastructure, cargo transportation, communications, uh, polar research, uh, implementation of uh, oil and gas projects, environmental protection, etc. In most cases, the complexity of issues in high latitudes requires the pooling of joint uh, resources, financial, technological, scientific, and organizational ones, as a single state uh, normally doesn't. Yeah. А как обычно у одного государства не бывает всех необходимых компетенций. И в этой связи мы 
обсуждаем сотрудничество с азиатскими партнерами по строительству судов в Арктике, по образованию, науке, защите окружения. The development of uh, transportation along the Arctic seas is one of the most promising large-scale projects. Russia is transparent when, when it comes to agenda and plans for the Northern Sea Route, which is also one of the important factors in the transition, namely critically important metals and minerals and innovative concepts that could accelerate it. However, to save peace, stability, make it a better place for all the Arctic communities, regardless macroeconomic and geopolitical trends, is our number one priority. This is the major challenge and opportunity that requires a serious dialogue and long-term partnerships aimed at achieving our common goals. The Arctic is a common home of mankind and an important regulator of climate, biodiversity conservation and environmental sustainability of the planet. And that's, <clears throat> that is for, it should be a space of scientific cooperation. Without active international cooperation, And uh, that exchange, it is impossible to establish full-fledged long-term work and ensure long-term sustainable development of the region. Therefore, Russia always welcomes partnerships on Arctic science and research aimed to achieve technological breakthroughs and innovative solutions for the sake of sustainable development. We have a vast experience of scientific collaboration with Asian partners and uh, are open to new opportunities in this sphere. The Arctic for us is a region with a great potential, a territory of breakthrough ideas, collective efforts, innovative solutions that would benefit all mankind. It is a land of peace and great opportunities, and it should remain as such. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Nikola Viktorovich. Uh, it won't be an exaggeration to say that it was indeed a keynote address indicating how open and transparent Russia is in forming new connections and uh, embarking on new projects in the region, which I believe uh, kicks off an amazing start to our discussion, which we suggest uh, we now proceed with. Uh, I want to uh, indicate that we now have an opportunity of simultaneous translation. So in case anyone feels more comfortable um, with this option, please feel free to press the globe icon below uh, in the panel. Um, and I'm now happy to give the floor to Professor Go Beijing from Ocean University of China, uh, who will, I'm sure, uh, show us uh, what the Chinese position uh, currently uh, towards Russia-China cooperation in the Arctic is. Please, Professor Guo, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Many thanks for the organizer to give me this opportunity to exchange with and learn from the friends and colleagues on the lines. So, and uh, as we know, the Arctic cooperation has been regarded as the political correctness. Any words, any suggestion, proposition about uh, Arctic cooperation yeah. will be hard, has, has been highlighted for a long time. So, but the question is, how can, what we can do to put this suggestion, this advice into effect? Put into practice. That's the critical. So today I would like to move to another point. That point that is the Arctic governance cooperation between Russia and 
Asian countries. And at present, what's the major concern for the Russian people about governance? So I think that is, and or I think it's not, it's not only the concern about of the Russian Federation, but also the other the other states and also the stakeholders. That is where will the Arctic Council go? So due to the special operate special military operation. So the the so seven Arctic states, we call it A7. A7, so an imposed sanction against Russia on the Arctic Council. They uh, announced, uh, they released one uh, declaration to uh, refuse to take part in any activities chaired by the Russia. So people, is wondering, uh, wondering. So, uh, ne so next year, next May, when Norway can take the rotation chair, what will happen? So what policy Russia will take at that time? That's the big concern for most people. In my in my mind, in my mind, I think it's a, so if a, it's a, it's, it's, it, it has been recognized that the art governments need the cooperation from all the countries, surely including the Russia Federation. So without Russia Federation involvement, so it is a impractical, for the good governance, for the good Arctic governance. So I believe Russia has maintained this rule, these principles. So it is a, so then another question is, so in the, it would be admitted, accepted by the, Art Council, paired by Norway, I think it is very, very possible. So, so why this year, so A7 choose the Arctic Council as the tool against Russia? I think the reason is Russia is chairing the Arctic Council. So let's take a look. The, the other international mechanism, for example, G20 and uh, ATCM, that is say in other international organizations and uh, platform, Russia is ad uh, admitted, accepted, and uh, no refusal. So next year, I think if uh, it's a, uh, it will be a, the Art Council will return normal. Will return normal. And the uh, United States and other other states will accept, accept Russia. So another reason is if the Art Council refuse to accept the Russia Federation, they cannot afford the price to push Russia Federation to Asian side, especially we will push the Russia and the China strengthening ties closely. That is not the interest of the United States. So I believe it, it will be smart and uh, wise option for the United States and, uh, to accept Russia next year, and surely the Nordic states will follow the United States, including the Norway. I think the Norway 
and the, and the United States, the bilateral region is also is is undergoing some change. Why? Due to the Nordic pipeline explosion, we find some of the, the intriguing scenarios is, is happening. This year, the Norway invite France and Germany to escort to, to guard the air power lines connecting the Norway and the Poland. But they do not send the invitation, invitation to the United States. Why? This is a very interesting point. So I think Norway, no, no, no states centered as Norway, they are smart enough to make right policy to admit, accept the right of education. So surely we cannot rule out these very, very extremely scenarios. That is, Russia continue, but Russia is still, is, Russia is still refused, even after the Norway chairs party council. If that happens, I think the solution, the very useful solution, that is the Russia Asian countries cooperation. Cooperation. So the more tie, more intensive ties between Russia and Asian countries, including especially the China and the India, so the more pressure US will suffer. So if that happens, so Russia will take we will stand in a very good, very good position that profit from this competition. I believe the Russian friends, they are wise, they are enough wise to make good decisions. So about, so that to say, more competition, more competition, more successful between Russia and China, regard of the Russian cooperation, so Russia will be more easy to win the acceptance from the A7, including the United States. So about, let's go to the points. What areas, what we, what we can cooperate between Russia and China? Energy, tourism, and lots and lots of infrastructure. Actually, some Chinese companies, including the private companies, they are strengthening, strengthening their participants in the Russian infrastructure. For example, in, in, in southern, in, in one province, Jiangsu province, one private companies, they have contributed some for the floating nuclear reactor for the Russia. For example, in my province, Shan province, my province is very famous for our manufacturer ability. So I think it's necessary to, to establish one working group to collect and merge very useful information and a very the right person and uh, to discuss our the concrete the concrete project and uh, about also the cooperation details. Surely another area that was one new idea come to mind my mind that is the research of the wires and uh, no, no, the permafrost wires and the bacteria is really urgent. It's really urgent and necessary. Why? Due to the melting, some prehistory wires and bacteria is, re is being revitalized. It's really alive. So some people concerns human mankind 
is very fragile to this the prehistory virus and the bacteria. So we hope to establish one international mechanism and to conduct to conduct the transparent the international the joint research avoid in uh, avoiding these virus and bacteria to be used as biological biological weapons so it's really it's really urgent issues we hope this uh, this 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 issue this topic should be put on the agenda thank you this is my fragmentation of ideas thank you thank you professor go and i would like to ask uh, our next speaker professor vladimir petrovsky chief research fellow from russia china world center of the russian institute of china and contemporary asia to reflect on what uh, your counterpart from China has just uh, said uh, concerning Russia-China Arctic cooperation and deliver your own uh, remarks and uh, assessment of the situation. Please, what's my opinion? Oh, thank you. Uh, dear colleagues, it's my uh, pleasure to join this interesting discussion. And as my Chinese colleagues told us uh, just now, there is a big potential of cooperation between Russia and uh, China in the Arctic. But uh, of course, you noticed that uh, the topic of our discussion is uh, the involvement of uh, Asian, the so called Asian players in the Arctic affairs. And first of all, we mean, uh, I think we mean, uh, we keep in mind uh, five countries which do have uh, an observer status at the Arctic Council mainly China, India, uh, Japan, South Korea, and Singapore. And uh, it's very obvious that after the sanctions were imposed on Russia after the February 24, so or uh, or, or these five, they uh, they split. Actually, you know that we have uh, the list of the so-called uh, Russia-friendly countries and uh, uh, Russia-unfriendly countries. And unfortunately, if to take these five uh, countries like Japan, Singapore, and South Korea. Uh, in the second on the second list, and of course you notice that uh, uh, specifically uh, right now we have uh, experts uh, from uh, Russia friendly countries here. I mean China and India. So uh, I would like to talk a little bit on the potential of uh, the uh, Russia uh, Russia China cooperation in the Arctic, and then maybe a few words uh, I would spend on. Uh, 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 what happened uh, with the others, uh, three of uh, five. And of course, I keep in mind that we have experts from India who, uh, who maybe would like to concentrate on uh, Indian involvement in the Arctic affairs. And of course, Professor Kim who talk about the Republic of Korea and its involvement in the Arctic affairs. But if to take Russia and China, the potential is really big. And uh, I would mention that uh, the uh, uh, Russia-China cooperation in the Arctic region becomes more and more important and more strategic after what happened uh, on February 24. Uh, I mean that Russia and China are becoming closer strategic partners, including the Arctic region. And uh, uh, especially uh, in the framework and in the context of the uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative proposed by China. And we remember that uh, in June uh, the year 2017, uh, the leaders of Russia and China agreed on cooperation in the development of the Arctic. And uh, they discussed the so-called Ice Silk Road, which was proposed by China. And actually, it's an important strategic route, which could become uh, part, uh, part of the uh, overall uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, you know that we have the so-called... Uh, Belt and Road Initiative, and we have the Maritime Silk Route of the 21st century, and now we discuss uh, this uh, polar or ice uh, Silk Road. And actually, uh, the involvement of our countries uh, in the development of this uh, ice Silk Road uh, is part of the uh, conjunction of the, you know, One Belt, One Road and the Eurasian integration within the 
uh, Eurasian Economic Union. For Russia, you know, uh, and uh, again, the interest of uh, the uh, Asian Five in the Arctic affairs uh, is basically about two points. First, the transit route. Uh, with the Northern Sea Route, if uh, to discuss Arctic. Of course, we'll keep, also keep in mind the so-called Northern West, West, uh, how do they call it? Uh, Northwestern Passage, which is uh, closer to uh, Canadian shore, but, but it's not developed uh, as much as uh, the Northern Sea Route, and is not as much promising as, as the Northern Sea Route, uh, which goes uh, along the coast of uh, Russia in the Arctic. So, first of all, the transit potential, and the second, of course, is uh, uh, carbon mineral resources, oil and gas, uh, which are developed and extracted in the uh, in the Arctic. And uh, for Russia, again, for Russia, the uh, if to take the Northern Sea Route, for Russia, it's not at present is it, it's it's not as much as a commercial project that could be, be become profitable soon, but it, rather as a, a strategic project, which uh, could become a long-term factor in the economic growth of the Arctic, uh, uh, Russian Arctic territories. For China, the, the Arctic is a shorter and safer route uh, linking mainland China with Europe. And uh, we know that in January, uh, the year 2018, uh, the white uh, uh, paper on Chinese Arctic policy was published for the first time. And in this particular document, uh, this document says that one belt, one road initiative is an important cooperation project proposed by China, and it should bring opportunities for parties interested in creating the Arctic Silk Road, which would contribute to sustainable economic and social development in the Arctic. So it's stated very clear that China is interested in developing the uh, 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 Arctic, uh, Arctic uh, Silk Road. So for Russia, uh, the, the, the uh, Russia keeps in mind of how to connect the how to uh, you know to uh, to bring together Northern Sea Route and Arctic uh, uh, Ice Silk Road. And uh, uh, in the foreseeable future, the main impetus for the development of the ice the Silk Road uh, is, uh, deals with economic projects uh, in the north of Russia. First of all, first of all, um, uh, oil and gas extraction. I mean, uh, uh, first of all, I mean, uh, uh, project run by Novatech company, uh, specifically. Uh, Arctic LNG 2, Yamal LNG, and Arctic LNG 2. And uh, basically, uh, at least uh, four out of uh, five uh, Asian places in the Arctic are interested to, to uh, somehow to join uh, these particular projects. Uh, and we know that, for example, China, uh, China has a 10% stake in the Arctic LNG 2. And uh, China is very active in, uh, to, in contributing to this project. But of course, now we have difficulties. This particular project uh, has difficulties because some of the, uh, the so-called Western stakeholders, I mean, uh, the France Total and uh, uh, Japanese stakeholders, they announced uh, that uh, they uh, suspend their uh, partnership uh, due, to the, due to the fact that they cannot remit their money Against again uh, because of the sanctions uh, imposed on Russia, they can't remit their money, and uh, uh, they decided they just suspended their partnership, and uh, they uh, also announced that they stop the future investment in the Arctic LNG two. And of course, all this brings uh, certain difficulties to the project. Uh, but however, for example, Japan, if uh, to talk about Japan, uh, Japan. Uh, uh, Announced that it not that it is not going to cancel completely its uh, partnership and its involvement in the Arctic LNG two in Sakhalin one and in Sakhalin two, uh, because uh, Japan is, st is still very much dependent on the Russian uh, natural gas and Russian oil. Uh, and for example, if you take uh, Singapore, uh, uh, 
several years ago, uh, they uh, uh, have had a deal with the Russian uh, uh, Rosneft. And uh, the Singapore company, Trafigura, they bought, uh, again, about 10% uh, stake in the so-called Vostok oil project, which is Taimir and uh, Krasnoyarsk region, uh, also the, you know, the Arctic region. But this year, uh, this company announced that due to the operation, Russian operation in Ukraine, it withdraws from this project. And now, uh, it, the comp uh, instead of Singapore company, we'll have a, a kind of a, a Hong Kong company uh, which runs this uh, project. That's how it works. Uh, and of course, I'm not going to talk uh, to, um, to discuss in detail the South Korean involvement again in the Arctic LNG2, and I uh, hope Professor Kim will uh, tell us more about it. Uh, but again, the future of the Arctic uh, development of the uh, Northern Sea Route and of, uh, and of the uh, Silk Road uh, deals with economics projects in Ruata, Russia. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, as, as, as uh, uh, Professor Gopaitin uh, told us recently, and uh, I know that uh, he was able to discuss it in detail uh, before that, that actually uh, the point is not about uh, the development of the Northern Sea Route as itself, but of the so-called uh, south uh, north to south communication routes, which could connect uh, the Russian Arctic region, specifically uh, reaching oil and gas uh, with the rest of the Eurasian continent, which could also become part of the um, uh, uh, silk, ice silk road. And uh, uh, again, I would say that uh, it's not easy. I mean, the development of the Northern Sea Route is not easy uh, in itself. Uh, it will require a lot of uh, time and a lot of money and resources uh, to develop. But I hope that Russia could become a strategic partner. Uh, China could become a strategic partner for Russia in the development of the uh, Northern Sea Route in the context of the ice um, Silk Road. Uh, if China, uh, for example, would be ready to uh, join the renovation and reconstruction on the, of the Northern Sea Route and in building of these so-called North-South uh, communication lines, whether it be uh, highways or specifically uh, railways. And uh, finally, I would mention that all uh, aspects of the Russian-Chinese cooperation in the Arctic is being discussed at present within the framework of the special intergovernment commission uh, run by Russia and China. And uh, uh, at present, it, it works like uh, Chinese experts and government officials, they attend the Russian um, Ministry of uh, uh, Eastern Territories and the Arctic, and have been briefed by the opportunities offered by Russia in terms of the Arctic development. And both then both sides discussed discuss what could be done. But I hope, that's uh, my, final, my final say is, that I hope uh, that our countries would be able to develop a kind of the uh, uh, complex memorandum of how to develop Russian-China cooperation in the Arctic. Um, uh, and that's the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vladimir Yevgenius. Uh, I believe that we will touch upon uh, the South North connections uh, to the route uh, a little bit further on as we discuss our cooperation with India. But uh, now um, I would like to ask a question because I do not see the new affiliate among the participants unless uh, she has some other name. Um, yeah, which is, I guess, correct. So I suggest we pass the floor further on to Dr. Yevgeny Kim, a leading research fellow from the Center for Korean Studies, also representing the Russ Institute of China and Contemporary Asia, uh, and concentrate and focus on South Korea-Russia cooperation uh, or possible engagement in the region. Please, Dr. Kim, the floor is yours. Спасибо большое. Я за последние три дня слушаю на английском языке Thank you very much. Uh, English is not my native language. And each country has its own feature, unique features, ways of uh, 
speaking their English, so I will speak in Russian. Um, there are three moments about concerning South Korean's uh, views on the Arctic. South Korea is now in the 10th place by the GDP and one has a sixth place by a volume of the external trade and more than 100 million dollars is conducted with Europe. So Korea is interested in uh, make, making their products available to their customers. And although most of its territory is related to uh, subtropic, however, uh, South Korea became an observer in the Arctic Council and in 2013, the government of South Korea uh, passed a special program and uh, concerning the Arctic development. Moreover, it has to be noted that uh, uh, current president of South Korea speaks about South Korean South Korean alliance with United States will uh, now participate in the in the solution of the global problems, global issues, and now it uh, has not only the support of the United States, but also uh, it of the. the Real country. Subsequently, its its outlook on the it it will it, it's not just a regional country like it was before South Korea. Uh, South Korea is a global power. Also, I would like to note that as South Korea is a military ally of the United States, it is obvious that it follows uh, strategy, joint strategy policies that uh, the United States follows in 21st century. United States would like to uh, would like to assert their dominance in the Arctic basin, and so one element, one of the elements that will ensure that is the United States uh, wants to make uh, the Arctic basin an international international uh, there are uh, the Arctic is a demilitarized part of the world so uh, uh, there it's the United States to give this status to the Arctic basin too. Americans uh, understand that maybe of Russia and South Korea uh, not just the Polar Institute but also Institute of Political Issues of World Ocean, and this institute is two times as much as bigger than the, this. And in their publications, they tell that it will, uh, the demilitarization of the Arctic Basin would be preferable. I think that Russian government should. Uh, Act of caution. It's not just about the 
demilitarization, but also uh, we we have proved by our recent research that uh, mainland part of the Russia in the Arctic Ocean is Scotland is much uh, longer than it was thought of earlier. It, it's it's much more longer than 200 miles. I would also note that uh, South Korean business in the Arctic Basin. First of all, South Korea will not uh, participate in any project be, uh, concentrated on building infrastructure on this uh, polar shipping lanes and it, it's, it understands the dangers of such infrastructure. Do you understand uh, that with this supply chain, logistics is the has the main importance in organizing the uh, functions of trade routes and shipping lanes? So we will just uh, work on logic profits from them, from it. Seawood, Northern Seawood. Uh, uh, ships are uh, coming up to the coast street and then they pass to the region that is not uh, the Arctic, part of the Arctic. They would like to, as, as Japanese too, that some sort of extra pot will be, South Korea will function as some, some kind of extra pot. South Korea is isn't going to participate in any uh, projects. They would in this 2013 program will participate in in supporting the indigenous peoples, Arctic indigenous peoples. And uh, they understand that Arctic indigenous people developed and they depend on the Arctic environment. So we have to support them. So I uh, think that they will begin their works on NGOs that will educate these peoples and will address this issue and they will try to convince this uh, popul these peoples and one more moment and then in this year South Korea is not a friendly nation anymore with Russia. So economic uh, cooperation is stunted. It would be possible to work with uh, small businesses and many representatives of small business of South Korea. Is, it's, it's for this tens of millions of dollars in so it's a structure and 
small business is not has do not part, do not uh, copyright with America. So I think the yes, Russian government could work with them. However, South Korean economy is a free market economy. But if uh, but if trade uh, volume is more than hundred million dollars, it should be it have to be insured. And this insurance corporation is a governmental structure. So they can give permission or they can may not. If it uh, consumes uh, more than one million dollars, so this opportunities for their business is restricted. So uh, small business should be. Спасибо большое. Interesting to listen to you. And uh, now it's time we move to India uh, and uh, start discussing the opportunities rising uh, in cooperation with this country, with uh, Dr. Amit Panjali, uh, on energy investment and climate duty from Gateway House, big friends of RIAC. Please admit, Robert, welcome to the Здравствуйте. Спасибо, что пригласили. Before we do that, I would like to give a quick overview of the Indian economy. Uh, Indian economy in 2022 and 2023 is going to be the fastest growing large economy in the world with growth rates of 6 to 7%. We have not been able to bring COVID under control entirely and the economy is now on the rebound. We are also the most stable economy in the South Asian region. Сейчас Индия это, является самой стабильной экономикой в регионе и одна из э, зон The main problem that India faces right now is the high import, oil import bill. We import almost 4 million barrels of oil a day which adds up to 1.4 billion barrels annually. And the price of oil had crossed $100 a barrel recently, which is a large drain on Indian resources. Similarly, the price of natural gas had risen to unaffordable levels in the last, has risen to unaffordable levels in the last one year. And this is also a big problem for India. This is a major issue because natural gas is used as a feedstock for fertilizer manufacture. It is not just the issue of energy security, but also an issue of food security. Uh, we also see that India is trying to shift its energy mix from traditional fossil fuels to new energy uh, sources, and also move over to new energy vehicles such as electric vehicles, which require minerals such as cobalt, nickel, and lithium, which are all in short supply in India. So the bottom line is that India is a large importer of natural resources that are being used today, which is oil and gas, coal, and it will be a large importer of energy minerals in the future as well. And that makes Russia a very complementary partner for India, given the large and the resources uh, uh, nature that Russia has and the dependence of resources, uh, dependence of resources for the Russian economy. 
The Indian view on Arctic is that it is a sensitive region which requires greater study and protection. There are some synergies that are there between the study of Arctic uh, Arctic regions and the Himalayas. Uh, Indian government has termed the Himalayas as the third pole, and we have also recently brought out our draft Arctic policy. The Arctic is also a very resource-rich region, and some of these resources are going to become accessible by melting ice. And bringing these resources into the world markets in a sustainable and a, a safe manner should be a priority for India as well. And finally, India has always stood for upholding of international law and cooperation in the Arctic regions. So, what are the areas where India and Russia can collaborate with a special focus on Arctic? The first, uh, the first area of cooperation that we see is the energy sector, as I mentioned, uh, in case of petroleum. Uh, India imports 85% of its uh, petroleum requirements, and this import dependence is going to stay. It is actually going to increase in the next 15 to 20 years as India's oil consumption doubles and goes up to 10 million barrels a day. In this kind of a scenario, it is important that India invests in new sources of oil and gas for its own requirements. At the same time, Russia is a resource-dependent economy. Russian economy depends on exports of oil and gas. And just as India needs stable sources of oil supply, Russia needs stable sources of oil demand. Uh, there is a word that Indians often use for oil, uh, which is to say supply security. And similarly, an oil seller requires demand security as well. And this has become even more important for Russia, given the sanctions that have been imposed uh, since 2014 on different Russian companies and which have now been tightened. A number of Western multinationals, such as BP and Exxon, have already announced their exits from Russia. In the long run, this will mean that uh, getting investments into Russian resources is going to be a, uh, in, in the Russian resources industry, is going to be a major problem. And it, as far as India is concerned, India needs to offset some of this impact so that the stability of oil and gas prices can be maintained. India already has some existing investments in Russian oil and gas, particularly Vancor Neft, Sakhalin, and Imperial Energy. These are some of the well-known resources uh, where, which produce oil and which have generated a good financial return for India. On the Indian side, there is a large Russian investment in a petroleum refinery on the downstream front. So as I had said earlier that India has invested in Russian resources and Russia has invested in the Indian downstream. India has traditionally not been very large, but it has picked up substantially in the last one year. Uh, for the first six months of this financial year, the Indi India's oil imports from Russia have already exceeded $10 billion, showing that if the price is right and the incentives are there, this trade can expand very substantially. Secondly, that as Russia looks for large markets, India is a natural partner. Western countries may refuse to deal with Russian oil, in which case India, which has a large collaboration in oil is already there. How can India and Russia expand this collaboration and uh, specifically in the Arctic region? And here we feel that the liquefied natural gas sector presents a growing opportunity. Russia is building several new liquefied natural gas terminals in the Arctic region including Arctic LNG-1, the Yakutia LNG terminal, and Arctic LNG-2. These terminals require multiple things. They require financial investment to uh, enable them. Without financial investments, these terminals cannot progress. LNG terminals do not come up without long-term supply contracts in place because this is an investment which will operate for the next 25, 30 years. Most of the LNG terminals, such as the ones built in Qatar and Australia, have also simultaneously tied up with buyers in with long-term purchase contracts. India is in a position to provide both of these, capital as well as long-term supply security for gas. There is also a possibility uh, in the oil space of replacing some of the existing Western investors in Russian oil and gas projects. BP, for example, has announced that it will be selling its stake in Russian oil company Rostev in the next few years. Uh, while right now there is political instability, at a future point, Indian investors should definitely try to consider 
how to take up these stakes from western companies we do not uh, our government does not share the view uh, that many of these governments and companies have uh, and our trade with russia is a testament to that and therefore if conditions are right india should also be willing to invest in uh, further in russian oil companies now we feel that any trade or investment with russia is likely to be driven by the indian government Uh, this is going to be a major constraint because indian economy in the last 20 years or so has become very much market driven and dominated by private sector however the private sector companies in india are likely to not deal with russia because of the western sanctions uh, so we will be limited to the role that government companies can play in indian petroleum industry indian petroleum industry is largely dominated by government companies more than 70% of the market Uh, is controlled by government owned companies and therefore further collaboration in oil and gas sector is unlikely to be affected oh, by uh, the issues i have just yeah, sure highlighted uh, the other part is that who are the indian companies that can therefore participate in lng terminals and the oil fields that i spoke about the first group of companies which can do this are the existing companies which have already invested in russia and this includes indian companies such as the oil and natural gas corporation indian oil and gain these are government owned oil companies which have strong balance sheets and a very large cash flow and it is possible that they will be able to expand the footprint they already have in russia the largest shareholder of these companies is the indian government and if the government is willing to deepen the uh, relationship with russia as government owned enterprises these companies will naturally follow the instructions the second set of companies which has not been explored very deeply but which needs to be brought up now are india's fertilizer cooperatives i had highlighted natural gas as the area of cooperation between india and russia especially the arctic lng terminals the biggest use of imported natural gas in india is for the manufacture of fertilizers india is the india is the second largest manufacturer and consumer of fertilizers because of its very large agriculture sector and its importance to food security bringing in fertilizer companies as long term partners for lng terminals makes economic sense because it provides the lng terminals with assured market access for the next 20 25 years secondly because fertilizers have a direct link to food security there will be a greater political willingness to make investments in natural gas sector in russia uh, because uh, clearly geopolitical developments should not lead to a food security risk in india therefore a uh, fertilizer company will have a greater political will and political cover to make such investments the third category which russia could look at uh, it, it look at uh, in india is dedicated investment funds which can invest in shares of listed russian companies india has a very large and a very diverse financial market and a very large pool of retail investors as well one problem which they face while investing in india is that we do not have access to natural resource companies when i look at the russian stock exchange i see a huge list of them are operating large natural resource reserves for an indian investor uh, a spike a rise in natural resource prices which is the biggest risk to his portfolio if this investor can be provided that foods to and the indian investor is able to get a hedge against resource price spikes however this will require creation of special vehicles Uh, special channels to uh, make sure that the money doesn't get uh, uh, routed through western financial systems and so on uh, this is an area which requires further study from both sides and finally there will be some private investors while uh, who will also be interested in investing in russia on their own but this category is likely to be small because most of the large financial investors in india will also have a big exposure to western financial networks we feel that investments are unlikely to pick up in a big way till there is some stability in the political situation and secondly any dealings with russia will have to factor in sanctions the view at gateway house is that uh, the western sanctions on russia are going to stay for a long time while we do not while our government does not uh, subscribe to unilateral sanctions 
it is nevertheless true that private companies can get affected by these sanctions and threats that uh, follow so the Uh, these uh, these sanctions will have shares rich in aluminium uh, gold nickel and so many other minerals which are required for new vehicles and new energy technologies investments in these sectors can be done in a manner similar to what i had highlighted in the previous segment the existing listed companies indian government still has control of companies in steel aluminium and uh, nickel and other sectors these companies can start partnering with existing russian operations existing indian investors small investors can be provided tools to invest in russian equity markets and finally private indian investors and uh, 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 private fortunes can also be encouraged to make investments in russia through india russia bilateral channels these channels don't yet exist and they will have to be created uh, since Uh, the economic disruptions that we have witnessed are likely to stay around for a very long time it is in interest of both the governments to start creating permanent financial flows channels between the two countries uh finally our view is that the geopolitical situation has altered irreversibly in the last few years uh any uh, the the disruptions which have been uh, which have been put in place for russian commerce and trade are likely to remain secondly india cannot afford to follow these kind of unilateral measures for its own economic welfare and well being following these measures will mean uh, destruction uh, great damage to indian economy and also risks to india's own food security uh, therefore it is in india's interest also to find out ways to deal with this new reality it will require more research a better understanding of sanctions that the western world has imposed and how to work through them and secondly in the long run creation of financial infrastructure between india and russia which allows the two countries to entirely sidestep the existing infrastructure in place that is all from my side thank you so much for inviting me again Thank you, Amit. Uh, it was indeed a very practical intake uh, concerning how we should create the conditions first in order to go uh, and embark on some grand projects, both financially, economically, and in terms of investment. Uh, and now I'm ready to pass the floor to Dr. Kumar Rajan, Associate Professor of the Center for Russian and Central Asian Studies, School of International Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. Uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you uh, thank you yulia amelinkova uh, drastvite dobre utra dobre vechir whatever it is depending on time and place so thank you very much and honorable nikolai korchnov and all my colleagues uh, i am grateful to uh, russian international affairs council and northeastern federal university yakutsk for uh, giving me this opportunity and i have spoken uh, to you for giving me this opportunity in different parts of russia organized their different centers on the same uh, issue and uh, many of the things have already been said by my colleague много вещей уже было сказано по метам бандария из мумбаи что я не буду повторяться и how india and russia can uh, collaborate on energy sector and fertilizer and very uh, useful details were there uh, i'll talk a little bit about uh, this uh, some of the you know india's arctic policy the way it has Uh, evolved in the last uh, few years and also i'll try to make one of you uh, suggestions why uh, how india and uh, russia can cooperate on this uh, uh, arctic issue uh, my first uh, submission would be that uh, india and russia are enjoying the best moment in the last three decades let me tell you uh, i have written extensively and i teach a uh, course on russia's foreign policy in my university and this university is one of the best known university in india and doing research Uh, on uh, i have uh, my center has around 130 uh, phd scholars who are doing research just on uh, russia and uh, central asia uh, so we are very aware of the developments which are happening uh, in russia and uh, russian international affairs council that's one of the sources when we do our research so thank you for publishing articles also and of course the criticisms of india russia relation was that Uh, that you know uh, this uh, india was uh, ha- not having much of economic uh, component of trade uh, with russia uh, our trade was mostly in the defense sector and many of the western critics used to say 
that uh, India-Russia relationship is uh, primarily about defense. Uh, but uh, I used to argue that that's not the case. And it's been proven uh, right by now that India-Russia relationship is not about uh, this, uh, just the defense cooperation. Yes, that's an important mainstay, important aspect of cooperation. But that's only one area. Uh, we have very uh, uh, historic, we have very strong uh, geopolitical, uh, you know, uh, this uh, relation. And uh, something that cannot be understood probably by many of the Western countries. And uh, India stood by Russia. Uh, India, uh, India, you know, uh, supported, uh, India refused to condemn, uh, you know, many of the things that the West would have liked India to do. But uh, having said that, you know, I see broader uh, India's Arctic policy uh, from that perspective and also the way uh, India can collaborate uh, with Russia on, on, on in Arctic. Uh, so uh, India's interest grew uh, primarily because of number of factors that that have been said uh, by number of scholars and which have been repeated number of times. Uh, melting of ice is of course one uh, factor. Uh, the climate change, uh, uh, there's another. Transport and connectivity is another area which has been highlighted uh, by many of the scholars, and that's also uh, important for India. And of course, the emerging geopolitics. And as my colleague Amit uh, pointed out very correctly, that uh, India is the rising economy in the in the next few years because we are talking about the future, a uh, future 10 to 15, 20 years. Uh, India would be uh, the third largest economy in the world. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, it's a good time for uh, India and Russia to strengthen partnership, to strengthen relationship. Uh, and uh, as uh, 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 Professor Vladimir Petrovsky pointed out that Asian countries, uh, two main interests are one is uh, transport and the second one is hydrocarbon uh, resources. Uh, I would like to add uh, two, three more factors uh, why India would be interested. Uh, apart from that, you know, India is also interested uh, in uh, scientific research because India is a little distant from uh, Arctic. So uh, we are very much interested in uh, scientific collaboration, uh, scientific collaboration, not only about natural sciences, but also about uh, different types of, you know, uh, my collaboration, which also includes uh, humanities and uh, social sciences. Uh, uh, recently, India came with uh, Arctic policy, and which is very rare uh, in the sense that you know the way Russia comes with a uh, military doctrine or foreign policy doctrine, uh, India does not bring that kind of doctrine. But India brought the Arctic policy that shows that India has started taking uh, the policy uh, towards Arctic very very seriously. Uh, and in that, there are six pillars of uh, this, and which for which very comprehensive, which practically includes uh, everything right from uh, this uh, this uh, uh, connectivity to economic issues, investment, uh, uh, indigenous uh, communities there. Uh, so uh, that shows that India is very keen and very uh, this interested. Uh, India also has a very uh, you know uh, committed now research, scientific research. It also has its uh, own station, uh, Himadri, uh, which is in the Arctic, uh, located in the Arctic region. And uh, since uh, 2013, uh, India became much more active uh, than uh, than uh, than it was earlier. So prior to joining the council, there was also a debate that whether India should uh, consider Arctic as a part of global commons as Antarctica is, uh, or it should be, you know, uh, it should join the Arctic Council as an, as an observer. But uh, the moment it joined, it, in a way, it recognized the implicit sovereignty uh, uh, the sovereignty of the Arctic Council members. So India's policy is now that it has recognized the exclusive economic zones of the Arctic uh, countries. Uh, and uh, India would be very much interested in uh, connectivity. As I said, that you know, uh, uh, India is a member of International North-South Transport Corridor. And, uh, and uh, India would like that transport corridor uh, between Russia to Mumbai uh, to, uh, no, uh, to get connected to uh, to uh, to uh, the the what you call polar road or the north uh, sea route etc. Uh, so uh, India is very keen to invest in that uh, transport connectivity and that would be needed uh, for the two countries because the import of energy from Russia has increased and now India would like to export uh, products from India to uh, to Russia and for that that connectivity uh, this international loss of transport connectivity uh, can. Uh, play an important role and i think you know uh, we should uh, take that uh, connectivity project very seriously uh, president putin also mentioned that uh, about that uh, that project and now india wants chabahar project in iran uh, which has been developed by india to become the part of international north south transport corridor 
And that would be an interesting development if uh, that is included. So connectivity is uh, one area, but India is also concerned about the emerging geopolitics uh, in two ways. One is about the kind of conflict uh, which uh, uh, which is uh, emerging in the Arctic region also. And now because you know many of the members uh, uh, which were earlier neutral states, especially Sweden and Finland, uh, these states now will become the member of NATO. And that will, you know, uh, create a kind of security dilemma, security uh, vulnerability for Russia. Uh, so uh, India is concerned about that. India, ideally, India would like to have a region which is uh, where there is no uh, geo militarization, uh, uh, no geopolitical tension. But that is unlikely the situation in Arctic, and it fears that uh, since Russia also has issue with a number of countries, United States, Denmark, etc. Uh, so uh, there is a concern that. Uh, no, uh, this uh, military issue or security issue might flare up between Russia and NATO uh, in that region also. And now because the A7, Arctic 7, many of the countries, the Arctic activity has been suspended. So India is concerned about that, uh, you know, the kind of geopolitics which is emerging in that region. Uh, India understands uh, Russia's Arctic third policy, uh, which uh, you know, is 70% of the Russian oil, 80% of natural gas. And India would like to collaborate very strongly and very closely uh, with uh, with uh, this uh, with Russia on uh, a, a number of issues, as I pointed out. Uh, so, uh, and India would also, you know, one thing that we need to remember that uh, now the geopolitics is changing. Uh, India believes that the Western countries are in decline. Uh, India also believes that some of the countries which can play a very important role, uh, for instance, they are the members of BRICS. And India is, an, is a very active member, as Russia and China are. So why not, you know, have a very strong policy of BRICS on Arctic? And uh, I think you know uh, that should be one area which should be explored uh, by the by the by the members here. Uh, India is uh, India would also and now in the next year uh, from now on India has taken the presidency of G20. Uh, India will also be hosting the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So since the Russian policy is to include uh, this Asian countries uh, collaboration with the Asian countries on the Arctic region, so I think you know there should there should be a strong push from Russia. Uh, uh, with the uh, with the with the members of BRICS and Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and uh, uh, I would also like to uh, uh, you know uh, make a very strong uh, suggestion uh, because uh, this uh, our 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 respected Nikolai Korchanov, uh, Chief of uh, Senior Arctic Officer, is here. So I would like to point out, sir, that you know uh, one of the areas again which needs to be explored, and I'm very bold in this thing, and it might be controversial. So you'll have to pardon me for that. But uh, you know, uh, India. Uh, is looking for investment. Uh, investment, especially in energy fertilizer sector, as Amit uh, pointed out very correctly. So I think you know, Russia also needs uh, capital, technology, investment. And uh, one more area which can be explored is uh, the workforce from India. Uh, I know that as, as, a, as, as a student of Russia, as, a, as something who has been, and I have been working on this issue, Russia needs labor power, Russia needs manpower, and Russia lacks manpower. And India has a very skilled manpower and also you know semi-skilled kind of uh, workers, which we supply to large number of oil producing countries. Uh, like if you go to see the Gulf Council or uh, you know the Arabian countries, uh, many uh, we have the largest uh, you know workforce uh, from India in those countries. And uh, uh, India also has experience in working in the very cold climate and we have the examples of Canada, etc. So I think, you know, and India would be very keen to lap up that kind of policy uh, if that comes from Russia. And uh, Indian, uh, in, why India is a safe, uh, you know, uh, why India should not, uh, Russia should not be scared of uh, inviting manpower from uh, India uh, because, you know, uh, India does not have any territorial claim in the Arctic and India does not, you know, have any... India cannot have any claim in the future also. Uh, Indian uh, people, as uh, as we see throughout the world, the way uh, they are very culturally rooted, and uh, but at the same time, they are not the people who create problems in other countries. And they have experience in working in the wild countries of uh, uh, Persian Gulf or the uh, other country. So I think you know, this is one area where uh, you know the Ministry of uh, this Foreign Affairs of Russia uh, can take note of. So these are the broader area. I think you know uh, focusing this issue in the in BRICS, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, very strong collaboration in energy fertilizer, uh, etc. And of course, uh, exploring the possibility of uh, inviting manpower from India. So these are my suggestions, and I'll stop it here. And if there are questions, I can answer it later. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dr. Kumar. I believe it was really useful because you have enumerated several areas that uh, haven't been mentioned earlier. So now we have a really comprehensive picture of what can be done uh, by Russia uh, in engagement with India concerning the issues. And uh, I was uh, with great interest taking notes myself. So I believe that uh, uh, there is a lot of room here for discussion and further inquiries. Uh, and we have another speaker coming up, uh, Dr. Katerina Kolbinova from uh, Bimo University, who is the director of the ICN Center. Um, this is Katerina Valerievna, the floor is yours. Hello, dear colleagues. Can you hear me? Yes, everything is okay. Is the translation uh, being done? I will be speaking Russian. Yes. Thank you very much Thank you for, for this, giving me opportunity, uh, opportunity to speak. For your invitation. And, although and uh, I will be speaking on I more general things. Talk more about more uh, specific and, uh, we all fields. Imagine that out of 10 ASEAN countries, uh, observers are Singapore. And uh, in relations with Singapore, we have some difficulties after Singapore joined the full-scale sanctions uh, against Russia. And uh, here, probably it's early to speak about uh, strategic avenues for cooperation, maybe economic, climatic logic will prevail over political one at some point in time. But uh, what can I say uh, currently uh, refers to the period before uh, February 22 and uh, my hopes for future. Uh, for Singapore, as we know, the issues of uh, competitiveness are very important. Uh, of Singapore being competitive transportation, logistical hub, as a center for technological innovation, for shipbuilding, and climatic agenda for Singapore is also important uh, in regard to Arctic because our colleagues say that the Arctic is a climatic barometer for all the countries that are in the Singapore latitudes. Informally, there are always some um, threats, uh, perceived threats of uh, Northern Sea Route replacing uh, the route via Singapore. Uh, well, anyway, before uh, the February 22, we had uh, marked out the avenues for interaction. In December of 21, uh, we held a Russian-Singaporean Arctic dialogue based at uh, the Institute of uh, Singapore and Skolkova Management School, and it was attended by a representative of Singapore who um, is dedicating his uh, career to this domain. Uh, during the anniversary summit in Sochi, uh, they also discussed Arctic topic and Russia expressed hope for strengthening and enhancing joint research, including in the field of technology, of drilling platforms that can work in difficult conditions. Um, there were also some ideas by Artur Chirengara, for example, that Singapore could support Russia's application to UN Commission for uh, borders of continental shelf, because for Russia it is also important. And in Singapore itself, uh, this direction is paid much attention to. There is so-called STAR agency, the technology and research agency. They express their interest in uh, joint uh, scientific projects. 
um, oil and gas extraction in difficult climatic conditions, biodiversity within frameworks of the Arctic Council as an observer. Singapore initiated two projects for biodiversity. And uh, this topic is important for all of the countries that are in the Arctic Council. And uh, as for shipbuilding, uh, there were projects, joint projects with Kepil Corporation. So what can we say about today's situation? I'm not a logistics expert. I'm not a shipping route expert. I see some prospects in considering a possibility of using Northern Sea Route as a full-fledged alternative of delivering, for example, LNG from Russian ports that are located in European part to Asian countries. Although there are some issues arising here, uh, currently we have information that Anyway, uh, the more viable way, even from St. Petersburg, is the southern one. But on the other hand, there are some messages and information, for example, uh, from China that Northern Syrut will be used by China for transportation. And this route is, uh, let's say, controlled by Russia. And uh, Russia is avoiding some complicated uh, issues uh, connected to insurances. Unfortunately, I cannot say anything else uh, very promising here because I don't see in the nearest future any dramatic growth of interaction between Russia and Singapore and other ASEAN countries. Maybe in a longer perspective, when we have solved our current issues, how we reorganize uh, the things, and then what will our interaction with Asia be? In particular, interaction with China in Northeastern countries. And uh, besides, from scientific projects that I hope will remain. Maybe it will evolve into some more Спасибо serious большое. logistics. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, thoughtful assessment of the situation, because sometimes it's, uh, I believe it's really also needed to highlight that not everything goes as smoothly as uh, we would like it to go, uh, because this is actually the platform for us to build upon and to go forward uh, keeping in mind all the difficulties that might uh, be faced along the way. Um, so I believe that we have already collected, uh, well, several points of discussion that we can uh, elaborate on further. And I suggest we start the discussion uh, by the comments uh, by uh, Dr. Anna Kiriva, also from Gimo University, Associate Professor in the Department of Asian and African Studies and the Research Fellow uh, at the Center for Comprehensive Chinese Studies and Regional Projects. So please, Anna Andreevna, share your observations <laughs> concerning the event. Thank you. Um, I will say a couple of words about Japan and also one comment on South Korea. Actually, Professor Petrovsky has already, I think, more or less covered uh, the situation with uh, the Japan's participation now, but I would like to fill in a few details. Um, as Japan uh, is very much dependent on uh, the import of oil and gas and LNG, uh, it has considered projects in the Russian Far East, uh, Sakhalin 1 and Sakhalin 2, uh, as very important to its energy security. However, it has always 
uh, strived to keep the share of Russia, of its import from Russia, um, below 10%, so that not to become too much dependent uh, on Russia. But at the same time, to diversify from the Middle East, where Japan gets main supplies from, and also have alternative source from Russia. Um, a very important issue for uh, Japanese investors, for Japanese companies, has been that um, supplies from Russia has uh, been very uh, favorable in terms of price um, and um, because there is rather short logistics and the price, uh, especially from LNG, uh, has always been uh, very favorable to uh, Japanese companies. Um, that's why have, they have always valued um, these kind of projects, uh, especially such as Halim projects uh, in the Far East. Uh, but Japan has always um, has also had um, kind of diversified interests in the uh, Arctic, and um, they also uh, include um, well energy, basically um, scientific cooperation um, and partly logistics. Uh, however, I should mention that uh, despite the interest and some research on the Northern Sea Route that uh, many Japanese companies and experts have made, they have not really uh, started to utilize it. Uh, despite from saying that um, there is a potential in the Northern Sea Route, actually Japanese companies have not really used it for transit uh, to Europe. So we, we mostly deal with uh, Chinese um, um, in terms of foreign um, stakeholders who uh, have at least uh, a little bit, but utilized the, the Northern Sea Route transit. Um, so in terms of uh, LNG projects, um, I think LNG is especially important for Japan uh, because of its um, very high level of um, transition to more greener, uh, to more sustainable sources of energy and, and has uh, been very long policy to focus on LNG. Uh, that's why Japan has really taken interest in different projects in the Arctic. However, um, uh, it was very reluctant for the first time to make such kind of huge investments. So um, uh, for the first time, Japan, Japanese companies, Chiyoda and Mitsui, participated in the construction of uh, in the um, uh, engineering and construction of Arctic LNG. However, they decided not to buy a stake in it, not to become stakeholders, uh, but just participated uh, in engineering construction, provided equipment. This was something that we saw um, like seven, eight years ago, um, and these works have already been finished. So uh, this is kind of um, the project that ha has been successful um, in, in Russia-Japan relations. And a breakthrough, um, because the, there used to be some interest in projects, but no actual stake of, Jap uh, of Japanese companies in the Arctic, a breakthrough came in uh, 2019 uh, when a uh, Japanese uh, state-owned uh, company, Jogmeg, and a uh, private company, Mitsui, decided to uh, invest in Arctic LNG2, 10% um, uh, stake, $5 billion, um, and also to secure the um, import of 2 million tons of LNG per year um, from Arctic LNG2. Um, so as already mentioned by previous speakers, um, February of this year has brought negative developments here. And um, the Japanese companies um, have declared that uh, they are suspending their investment, suspending their share uh, in the project. And also there is a huge number of different kind of sanctions uh, in place, financial sanctions, also financial restrictions from the Russian part. Um, but probably um, one of the biggest hurdles is that any new investment uh, from the Japanese side um, are now prohibited to Russia and can be uh, actually implemented only by special license uh, by the Japanese government. However, as the investment into Arctic LNG had begun before that, uh, in, in theory, um, it can be still something that the Japanese companies can actually uh, make and implement. Um, there has been some kind of controversy regarding um, has there been any financing since February this year uh, by, by the Japanese companies in Arctic LNG2? Um, 
as far as um, the uh, the general understanding goes, uh, in March it was reported that uh, the Japanese companies will stop financing this project and just suspend their share as well as Total has. Um, however, there has been some news in November, just um, in, in early this month, uh, that the head of Jogmeg uh, stated that Japan is still interested in Arctic LNG2, has no desire to exit the project because it is important for its future energy security. And that uh, there also has been news that it still transfers money, uh, specifically Jogmeg, not the private company Mitsui, but the state owned Jogmeg. Uh, into this project. Um, however, I think it needs to be confirmed uh, if it really is um, um, a stakeholder. Um, and um, the situation is kind of volatile and uh, generally Japan, Japan's participation um, remains um, an issue of Japanese sanctions regime. And um, of course, it depends very much on the geopolitical situation um, here um, between the countries uh, generally. So the, it is very uncertain if Japan really continues its uh, stake uh, to, to, to be a stakeholder in Arctic LNG2. Uh, but if it does, um, in addition to about five to six um, um, million tons from Sahalin to it will also import um, two million uh, tons of LNG from Arctic LNG too. So it 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 will be a boost uh, if such a decision is taken by Japan to continue its participation in the project. However, financing uh, remains an issue, um, and also there used to be a very interesting project on the LNG gas storage, uh, gas storage in Kamchatka, uh, where Japanese companies wanted uh, to, to take part in, and there was supposed to be an investment by JBIG, Japanese Bank for International Corporation. However, um, the project was still at uh, the stage of feasibility study mostly, and the investment had not started before February. And since then, uh, JBIG has announced that it will suspend all new investment into Russia because of the the sanctions of, of the uh, sanctions adopted by the Japanese government. So probably Japan's participation here is kind of out of the question for the time being, uh, which is very unfortunate because Japanese companies were supposed to provide technology for this uh, LNG gas storage in, uh, and LNG hub in Kamchatka. Um, and the last thing about the South Korean companies just for for the general discussion, I think what, what has always been very important in terms of South Korean participation of South Korean companies in the projects in the Arctic has been um, the contracts um, at um, the contracts to build uh, gas tankers. Um, so uh, most of them were supposed to be built at um, Zvezda shipyard in the Russian Far East. Um, and there has been two major um, uh, South Korean companies involved in this. Um, uh, one is Dao and the other are Hyundai Heavy Industries. And according to the news that we have now, um, uh, the the first one, uh, Dao, has um, actually uh, decided to uh, stop building the three tankers which had been contracted specifically for Arctic LNG2 uh, because of the um, of the current geopolitical situation, because of the financial uh, sanctions and issue with payments. Uh, they mentioned that they had not received payments from the Russian side. That's why they will stop this contract at all. It will be terminated. Um, so this is um, already three, three tankers out of 15 supposed to be built by South Korean contractors for um, Arctic LNG2 have already been kind of uh, terminated. So, and there is still an issue if the other uh, 12 are going to be built at the star by Hyundai Heavy Industries. Um, as far as I understand from the news, the, the, the construction also has been somewhat suspended. And uh, this is a huge question, as Professor Petrovsky has mentioned, if Arctic LNG2 actually starts operating in time and if um, Russia manages to uh, finish these uh, gas uh, tankers for Arctic LNG2, I think, which is also very important for the delivery uh, because Russia has no other <laughs> gas tankers 
which are available for um, uh, exporting uh, LNG from Arctic LNG too. So um, just um, to summarize in terms of Japanese and South Korean involvement, uh, we have a huge impact of the current political situation and of the sanctions. And I think that their participation um, uh, very much uh, is influenced by how actually these geopolitical uh, dynamics evolves in future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna Andreevna. Uh, so we are coming to an end of the session. Dear colleagues, if there are any comments, any questions, any reflections, I believe it is high time uh, you raise them. So feel free to identify yourself by raising a hand or just uh, switching on your mic and uh, firing it off. So we are now uh, left, unfortunately, by the foreign minister, so we can be uh, open for any sort of discussion. Okay, please, Anton. Uh, Anton Alexandrov, our program assistant, uh, Russian International Affairs Council. Uh, yeah, dear colleagues, uh, uh, thank you for your insightful contributions. Uh, it was very interesting and exciting to uh, listen to. And uh, my question uh, concerns uh, the status of international zone of Arctic. So as Professor, uh, as Professor Kim mentioned, uh, there are many countries uh, that believe that Arctic should be granted a status of um, international zone where all countries should be equal in pursuing their interests, their national interests. Uh, this position is also heavily endorsed by uh, the United States. And my question to all the speakers, uh, what approaches do those countries we discussed have on making Arctic an international region? Because as far as I know, China is very interested in uh, making it uh, international as well to pursue their own interest there. Um, and uh, my question is how this and uh, other approaches can influence bilateral relations uh, with Russia in the region. Thank you. Thank you. Your colleagues who can address the Prince Vladimir Evgenievich. Well, actually, thank you for this uh, good question. I think that uh, the reality is, in terms of international law, that Arctic is really divided between uh, the so-called Arctic states. And uh, I mean, uh, uh, not like in uh, Antarctic, which was really uh, announced as a kind of international zone with the, in accordance with the law, inter, an international treaty, international Antarctic treaty, of 1958, but the reality in Arctic is uh, quite different. So uh, what we have, we have uh, the re Arctic region, which is being really divided into sectors, national sectors, uh, with the exception of the uh, polar zone itself, Northern Pole. And uh, also we have the uh, UN uh, Convention of International Sea, UNCLOS. Uh, uh, which says uh, uh, that uh, some of the uh, Arctic sea routes uh, could be claimed as international. But again, the, 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 the situation is uh, very much complicated because uh, the same convention says that uh, the Arctic countries uh, which uh, face uh, the, uh, the Arctic coast, they have their own uh, right uh, to regulate the uh, navigation uh, in the uh, in the sea areas which are uh, close to the national territories, uh, I mean the uh, it also includes uh, including the economic uh, economic zones. What it means uh, that, for example, Russia endorsed a special law on the Northern Sea Route, which says that uh, the Northern Sea Route is a strategic national transportation uh, route of the Russian Federation. And some of the Arctic Council states, including the United States, for example, uh, they argue that uh, this is not true. So the point is the different, uh, different interpretation of the UNCLOS. That's what we have in reality. And uh, moreover, the United States, for example, uh, they are being prepared to have their uh, navigation, uh, their, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
the uh, military patrolling of the uh, of, of these uh, sea areas, which uh, uh, the same which they do, by the way, in the South uh, China Sea. And they're going to, uh, to do the same in the, uh, you know, territorial waters, which Russia claims to be part of the national territory, which is very dangerous. But some uh, some other countries, they do not, uh, they do not uh, think like uh, uh, the United States uh, and, uh, and other Western countries, and Scandinavian countries, for example. I mean, China. China do not object that Russia regulates. Uh, the northern uh, the navigation of the northern sea route, uh, which which is uh, really the basis for Russian China strategic cooperation. So uh, uh, there are some. Uh, moreover, Russia is not going to stop international navigation uh, along the northern sea route, and uh, Russia is over, is ready to open northern sea route for any any kind of uh, international. Uh, uh, cargo vessels, but there is, of course, there are special regulation of navigation, especially for the naval ships. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I believe Anna Andreevna also wanted to add something. Right. Just yeah, just two, two quick words on Japan. Um, Japan has also got a that into the kind of um, common. Um, common space, um, a kind of, um, well, part of the global commons. So uh, it's it, it would rather like to see um, kind of um, new, more, um, well, more uh, transparent and more equitable and what it calls actually more just uh, regulation of the Arctic, meaning not the dominance of the uh, Arctic states, but uh, Kind of the Arctic as a part of, um, well, uh, generally global um, global goods, global values, so that all the all the countries who want to participate should participate, and especially here, Japan's policy has been focused on energy specifically. Japan has many times mentioned that it considers our, our, our energy in the Arctic as kind of a, um, global. Um, um, well, global value, a part of global commons, and that all states should have kind of uh, uh, just equitable share to that. So I guess here, uh, very surprisingly, but it, it posi its position is closer to China, actually. Um, and, and I think that it's very interesting that China pursues kind of different um, positions towards uh, the freedom of navigation and uh, uh, the use of resources here in the Arctic and uh, completely another position in the South China Sea. And you also had a question, I believe, right? So if, if, if we have finished on this topic, my question goes to uh, Professor Ajahn Kumar. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor, for your very interesting presentation. Um, well, um, as you have mentioned, uh, if Indian companies actually come and invest in the Russian Arctic projects, uh, it, it has to be a kind of a very um, huge investment with very long years or maybe even decades uh, to wait until it pays off. Um, so what do you think, what, what, what are the major um, hurdles, uh, why haven't we actually seen Indian companies already investing um, in, in the projects except for Sakhalin 1, which used to be a long, long time ago? Um, and what do you think can be done now between Russia and India to facilitate this kind of investment? Because Russia really does need... Uh, uh, Anna Kiriwa for this question. Uh, I think, you know, Indian company now uh, would be very much interested uh, earlier, the case as it was that you know uh, the the collaboration, economic collaboration between India and Russia, also historically it was not very high. Uh, we had a very strong defense cooperation. We had very strong uh, cooperation in the in the space sector. Uh, we have very strong cooperation in the nuclear energy. But unfortunately, when it came to Indian investment, so first earlier the historically Indian companies were not not very big private companies, the way it is uh, growing now. Uh, we have many companies which are now in the Fortune 500 uh, list. So uh, Indian companies are growing very fast. Uh, India's investment, if you see, in the last uh, one, uh, ten, one decade or so, uh, it has grown extensively in the European countries, in the United States, in UK, large number of countries. And now 
Uh, they're planning to invest in, in Russia also. Uh, there are a few uh, irritants, there are a few uh, uh, issues. Uh, one is one of the complaints which are always uh, you know, coming from the Indian corporate side, that even the getting the visa is very difficult. Uh, then, uh, then the language issue is there. Uh, then if Indian companies go, if they do not have a permanent uh, long-term kind of security from the Russian side, so that again uh, becomes a problem. Uh, India's economic cooperation, if you see, it was less than $10 billion just uh, two years back. So it was very low. But now India's trade with Russia uh, in the last few months, it has been... Uh, been 18, uh, $18 billion, which is uh, massive and several hundred percent increase in the last few months. So I think, you know, and India's relation with uh, Russia, now it has been proven beyond doubt that uh, India will not come under the Western pressure. Uh, India, will, uh, India will maintain its strategic autonomy uh, as far as the foreign policy is concerned. And Indian company uh, companies are very much interested in investing now uh, if they are given security, if they're uh, if they're enabled to invest, uh, provided the basic uh, security, etc. Uh, so I think uh, you know uh, if Russia kind of uh, uh, pushes, especially in energy sector and the, and the fertilizer sector, uh, so uh, Indian companies would be very much uh, interested. Uh, and also there are other sectors which can be uh, promoted. Uh, uh, tourism, etc., is one sector where uh, you know uh, in and uh, Russia can uh, can look at look into it. But yeah, so uh, these were the reasons why companies were not invested but now i think india has the capacity india has the and the resources and willpower to invest in russia of course sanction would be an issue but i think there are ways uh, through which india and russia can bypass the sanction also and india is willing to bypass let me tell you thank you thank you thank you Gautam kumar and we have another question arrived uh, by our ilia uh, ali mogul kumar please alina uh, fire it up uh, yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that I'm glad to be here. It was really interesting to listen to all your speeches. Thank you so much. And I would like to ask, uh, what do you think about the future of uh, the Ar Arctic Council? It's just it just said that uh, Arctic region has to uh, remain neutral despite all the political issues between the countries because it is um, kind of our common interest to maintain cooperation there in different spheres. But it seems that um, this concept um, doesn't really work nowadays. So what do you think? Uh, can Arctic Council work um, without Russia and will it be effective? Can we um, maintain cooperation within this um, organization? Thank you. I would actually a little bit adapt to this question and probably refer to what Professor Go uh, said earlier. Unfortunately, he already left us, but I believe this is uh, somehow connected with his idea that uh, uh, increased cooperation between Russia and China or Russia and other Asian parties will uh, exert some kind of external pressure on uh, Western powers of the Arctic Council and uh, push them uh, uh, towards a uh, more uh, collaborative stance uh, at the council. I would like to ask other participants if they see this uh, viewpoint as fair, if they share the observation uh, of Professor Go in this context uh, or not particularly, especially our Indian colleagues, but anyone. Thank you. Do you, do you want me to answer? <laughs> Yeah, okay, yeah, if you want to start, please. There's somebody else, uh, otherwise, okay. So I think, you know, the future of uh, Arctic Council, uh, I think that's a real issue as a very nice question, uh, Filippo. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, uh, for some time I see the uh, the kind of geopolitics that is emerging that, you know, you have Russia on one side uh, and some Russia-friendly countries, but also you have Western countries. So uh, the dispute is, uh, you know, is going to continue. Uh, in in Ar and it will it will have its impact on Arctic Council also. So I think uh, some of the Asian countries, especially India and China, uh, South Korea, Japan included, I think they should try to push some kind of you know this will play a bridging role between the West and Russia, uh, so that uh, the the Arctic region 
is not militarized. The tension in the Arctic, Arctic should not flare up. Uh, this is uh, not about the about Russia. This is about the entire humanity. Uh, whatever happens in Arctic will impact the entire world, uh, whether it's the climate change or the uh, the melting of the ice and the kind of you know viruses or bacteria that will emerge from there. So we need to have very strong international uh, policy. Uh, we do recognize, at least India recognizes, the rights of uh, uh, this uh, Arctic nation as. Uh, Anton Alexandrov asked that question. So India now has joined the Observer Arctic Council. So ideally, India would like to have the global commerce. But let me tell you that India has changed its position. And now India recognize, recognizes the rights of Arctic uh, Council members. Uh, so there is a change in India's policy. India, in fact, feels a little slighted by the fact that the Antarctica becomes the global commerce. But when it comes to Arctic, uh, you know, uh, this is uh, the countries have divided among themselves. And that's the kind of concern. And India thinks that's the kind of colonial uh, division of the international territory. Uh, India is not very happy. But again, India, has, uh, India does recognize the territorial rights of Russia and other countries also. So I think you know, the issue will uh, continue. Some of the tensions are likely. Uh, in, uh, Russia has con definitely has issues with America and Alaska. It has issues with uh, Norway, uh, uh, Denmark, etc. So I think, you know, uh, that need, the first thing that needs to do, uh, especially the Asian country, that they, they should try to revive the Arctic Council. And uh, this would also push for demilitarization and this would also put, uh, push for some kind of a joint collaboration uh, among the Arctic uh, country members, including observers. So uh, that's, that's how I see Arctic in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else, would, would anyone else uh, like to comment on the questions? If no, then I suggest we wrap it up. And uh, I'm passing the floor here to our colleagues from Yakutsk, Bulgarian uh, Maximova back uh, to conclude the session. Thanks a lot, Yulia. And uh, I've been uh, in two uh, events at uh, the same time. Uh, you know, here you can see Russian Asian Consortium for Arctic Research, which was uh, um, established uh, yesterday in Yakutsk in the Northern Sustainable Development Forum plenary, plenary session. And now uh, the same time as uh, yours session, uh, round table, it was uh, the second um, uh, meeting of uh, RACAR. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, Gopitsin, <laughs> Who was with you uh, the first in this uh, round table after he was with us uh, also when he signed uh, an agreement with uh, Northeastern Federal University and Ocean um, uh, University of China. And uh, but uh, about Rakar, a few words. Uh, we uh, know that Indian uh, participants, Indian experts are very uh, wondering about the Arctic, about the North, and uh, uh, we uh, know it. Uh, why? <laughs> we know it uh, because of uh, the meeting in Murmansk where you've been yet uh, um, one month ago, uh, also online. Uh, but uh, it was very informative for me, for my colleagues from Yakutsk, from Russia, that you have a lot of interest in India uh, about uh, the uh, Arctic issues and the northern issues. And it is very important for us. And uh, we hope to go uh, to India uh, in the beginning of the next year. Uh, in February. So, uh, Amit, dear Amit Bandari, dear Rajan Kumar, uh, I know you a <laughs> uh, uh, few time uh, because of uh, um, REAC. Uh, thank you very much, Yulia, and uh, thank you very much for your team that you had a lot of work to um, contact us, all of us together. 
and it was wonderful these months to be uh, with you, with uh, your present presentation. Uh, we presentations, uh, researches. We uh, are very um, happy <laughs> now that India is very interested in the Arctic issues because uh, you know uh, me is for me I. I'm uh, an expert in the Canadian Arctic. So when uh, you have, uh, I have my research in the Canadian Arctic, it's uh, not simple, but uh, it's uh, it's very uh, similar to Russian uh, experts uh, sometimes and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But when uh, now we have uh, very, uh, hard and uh, difficult uh, geopolitics uh, in the world. Uh, and when I live in Russia, I understand that it's important that uh, maybe uh, in other uh, countries are so uh, close to Russia <laughs> because we uh, are living in Europe Asia. So um, I, uh, we need to uh, do more to uh, have more contacts uh, one to one. So uh, I think that um, it's very important that the round table as um, like this uh, was held uh, and is in progress now uh, in the Northern Sustainable Development Forum. Thank you very much. And as an organizer of uh, the Northern Sustainable Development Forum, I I am looking forward uh, for your participation offline in Yakutsk next year. Uh, we uh, we are held in this uh, forum uh, each year. So uh, you're welcome to Yakutsk. You're welcome to Russia. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Maxino Maximova. Uh, you are welcome to India. Uh, we are here in January. Please come. Uh, uh, you have my email address. So uh, all of you, anybody planning to come here? Uh, uh, Indians love Russian. You should know that. Да, конечно же. Вы тоже, пожалуйста, приезжайте в Индию. Будем всегда рады вас видеть. И если Если кто-то хочет выпустить вместе статью, тоже, пожалуйста. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone. So, on behalf of the Russian International Affairs Council, I would also add up a couple of words uh, to thank all of you again uh, to being in touch with us, to collaborating with us, and uh, remaining our friends throughout all this year. So, hopefully, we will see each other not once uh, at other events, uh, either in Yakutsk or in Moscow or anywhere else. Uh, always, uh, always delighted to work with you. And have a good day, everyone. So, until later. Goodbye. Recording stopped.